Hello everyone, welcome to Builder Buy. We've passed the smoke test, which was pretty amazing. That was uh, quite an ordeal. Now I understand what Tony was going through. The Threadripper 3 takes a little bit longer to get things going before it does its interrogation and uh, integrates itself to the system and says, okay, I'm ready to go, let's boot. So getting used to that took a little bit of uh, like, you know, what's going on, what I do wrong, while I'm second guessing myself. The Threadripper 3 just takes longer to boot, you gotta give it some time. So what we're gonna do now is the question of the day is how long does it take to install Windows 10 on a Threadripper 3? We're gonna find out. And we need to do three things. Number one, we need to install the operating system. So two, we need to get the drivers installed. So one, we get the operating system, two, we get the drivers. And then number three, the drivers consist of a motherboard CD, we wanna get that installed first. Then we wanna get the drivers for the video card installed. Once all that's done, then we'll plug in the network and then let Windows do its thing to get everything else updated. If we plug the network in right now, Windows would take over, takes about 45 minutes, slows down the process of getting the drivers installed. So what we're gonna do now is uh, see how long that takes. Let's get started. So what we're gonna do is take this stick. We have Windows 10 2004 on this stick. Now, if there's any issues and we get with a BSOD on here while we're trying to install Windows, the number one problem, the reason would be for that would be if Windows does not like the Wi-Fi card in here. The Wi-Fi card in here is gonna be fine. It's the card we used before, but if you have uh, any thoughts about upgrading your Wi-Fi card and you're trying to install Windows 10, what you're gonna to need to do is slipstream the drivers if you have the newer card. So we should be good to go with this. So what I wanna do is tilt this up. So we're gonna plug this into one of our USB 3 ports. We're gonna power up. And once we power up, then we'll do a count and see how long this takes. Now, when the system first comes up and interrogates itself, it's going to take a little long for the boot, so you have to be prepared for that. But once we get something up on the screen, then we'll flip over and we'll show you. Until then, we're going to be working with the cameras. So we're going to power up. Let's see how long it takes. One, two, three, start. Now, whatever else we need to do in the BIOS, we'll come back to the BIOS afterwards because we're going to do just one video on the BIOS to show you some of those kind of settings. Now, once we have something up on screen, we'll show it to you. But this should be pretty quick. The longest process is waiting for the interrogation. Okay, PC speaker, we heard it pop or post. We've got screen, and we are ready. Load optimized defaults, then boot. And if you notice, it says boot failure detected. That's because we don't have an operating system installed. But we do know that our four terabyte Sabrent NVMe drive is seen. I've already checked that. I'll go back and show you when we do the BIOS video about what all is going on. So we want to proceed from this point on. So we're going to take the default, press enter, and we're off to the races. Now right now we have all the fans, which are four pin fans, not two of fans, plugged into the motherboard, and they are controlled by, by the motherboard. Okay, here we go. The longest procedure is going to be waiting on the user to do our thing. While this is, wow, that was quick. While this is proceeding, we're gonna to need to install the two thermistors. We don't have those installed yet. Then we can control uh, functionality of other areas of heat. But until then, everything controlled by the motherboard is based on what the CPU is doing. So, and that's the defaults. Now here where it's asking for a key, we're gonna say I don't have a product key. We'll blow past that. We'll come back and put the key in later. Just remember that. And what we may do is a separate video showing you how to acquire a key inexpensively some, from one of the SCD key places. So that could be interesting. So we're gonna say right here, I do not have a product key, so we will go ahead with our install. And we are gonna pick Windows 10 Pro. After all, this is a Threadripper 3. Windows 10 Pro next, accept the EULA, next. We're doing a custom install, Windows only. It sees the drive, all we need to do is click on next because we're working with native chipset support, which is why we see the C drive, native chipset support. So we click on next, and it'll create one large partition, and away we go. So number one, collecting information. Number two, installing Windows, copying Windows files, getting files ready for installation. We'll hear the fans throttle up as it goes through the procedure. What's curious, the one thing we have not tried yet is installing Windows from a USB-C port. What we might do is come back later and install that from a USB-C port, since we should have native chipset support. See how that goes. That might be interesting. In fact, I like that idea. I hadn't thought about that. But the problem you're gonna to have to remember is even if we use a USB-C port, we have to use a memory stick that is 32 gigs or less because that media has to be formatted for FAT32. 
So will that work? That's a good question. It should work, but we have to match one new technology with one old technology. And FAT32 gives you some idea how big the partition would be. So here we go, ready to restart. That was pretty quick. Restart now. And by default, as Windows comes back up, it will automatically bypass the process and go to the files that are now on the drive as it runs the routine. So when it comes back, we'll go back. And the longest wait process for the boot is getting through the bootstrap while the system checks itself. And here we go. I hear the fans kick up. We should hear the post, which is the power on self-test. There it goes. Now we're ready. Booting. And we're back to the races. And this is the Gigabyte TRX40 Designare motherboard with a Threadripper 3 3970X processor. Bang for the buck. And still Gigabyte, starting services, getting ready. We'll see how long this goes. Now, we probably won't show this in real time, but we will let you see it. And we will time it, and when it's finished, we'll put a clock to it and tell you how long it took. Because remember, the question was, how long does it take to install? The boot process is slower on a Threadripper 3, excruciatingly slower. But once we're up and running, we should be pretty fast and good to go. We just have to be patient. So operating system, driver CD, then we have to go online, and we'll go to, here we go. And my friends, here we go. I have to again wait for the boot process. Once we do the driver CD, then we go online. Microsoft is going to start working, so it's going to be a race against time. We'll go to AMD and download their drivers. There's some feature sets we'll get for the chipset that we wouldn't get for the drivers from Gigabyte, such as it is. Then we'll go to EVGA's website, download their drivers, and see how those look. And we might end up going to NVIDIA to pull their drivers down. But I'm hoping we can stop at EVGA. We'll see. And that's evga.com slash drivers. We'll put a link up to all this information. Still waiting for the post. Fans kick up first. Then I'll hear the speaker. Heard the speaker. So now we're on post. Power on self-test. And we have Gigabyte back. So we're on a USB 3 port. We use these little thumb drives. Bought a quantity of these just for this sort of thing. One set we use for installing Windows of various flavors from the Windows Media Creation Tool. And another set we have set up for when we need to hit the Windows password and reset those. Let's start with region. Is this right? United States? Yes. U.S. keyboard. You want to add a second keyboard? Skip. You can always do that later. It's going to try to connect to the network. We're going to say down here on the bottom left, I don't have internet. So we're going to click on next. And there's more to discover. We're going to click right here again on the left. Continue with limited setup. This is an offline account. We do not want an online account. Now, who's going to use the PC? We are creating an offline account. So we'll put in the username. I'm going to blow past the password. Nobody's going to be using this but me. And all this stuff for privacy settings, I can go through this later. Right now, I'm okay with it. I'll accept it. I can always change it. Do more across devices with active history. I'm going to say no. Let Cortana, I'm going to say no. Not now. And if you've seen our video on Cortana and how to disable it and you got rid of search, the other thing we'll be able to do is uh, to replace Cortana with a better search option. We've got a video on that. We use listary.com and, of course, the second program that lets you look inside the files. Now, this might take several minutes. Don't turn off your PC. We're going to stay glued to this screen and see how long this is going to take. Will it be faster? Don't know. The only way to do this faster would be through a USB-C port. Now, for those of you who ask, could I install Windows through a Thunderbolt 3 port? Well, the problem with that, that's not a native chipset. That requires a driver, which brings up an interesting point. If we had native chipset support for Thunderbolt, yes, we could, but without native chipset support. What does that mean? You have to load a driver. At that point, remember during the installation when it was asking and showing us the drive? If we loaded a driver disk to see the controller, once the controller is seen, then it can see what's on the controller. Then, yes, we could have, theoretically. And Windows is up. Voila. So the next thing I like to do is a few things to customize. I don't want to see the search. That's the first thing I'll do. Do not show me the Cortana button. Do not show me search because I have Windows Flag S to bring up search. And all I have to do is press the escape key or click on the desktop to get rid of it. Okay, I'm going to go to uh, right click because right now I still have the ability to personalize. I'm going to go to themes. I'm going to go down here, scroll down to where it says desktop icon settings. Desktop icon settings. And this will allow me to put my icons on the desktop that I like, which is a little bit of everything. 
I like to have the computer, the user files, the network, and the control panel. So at this point, I'm going to say, OK. Close that out. Now with the icons up, I still have to double click on the desktop. I'm going to change that to a single click. So I'm going to go into the control panel. And up here under category, I'm going to change that. Large icons. Now I can see everything. And we will go to File Explorer Options. And right there, we are going to single click to open an item. And I'm going to do one other little tweak right, right quick that I don't normally do, but I want to show you this little tidbit of information. We're going to go to the mouse. And for any of you that do training or demonstrations or presentations, and up at the top, we're going to tab over to pointer options and right here. We're going to put a check mark, show location of pointer when I press the control key. We'll click that. We're going to say OK. And what that does, when I show you where mouse is at and I press the control key, you see that? I am pressing the control key. Learned something new, didn't you? Didn't know about that one, did you? Hope that helps. Now we will zoom out. In fact, while we're at it, one more piece of information. For those of you that are wondering how I zoom in and zoom out, this is a default behavior with Windows. You just have to know what the keyboard shortcut is. What I am pressing is Control Plus to zoom in, which loads the application, then I minimize it. Then I can zoom in with a plus or zoom out with a minus. Another tidbit of information. Hope you enjoyed that. And now Windows is set. Now I can single click on the desktop just as if I were doing a web page. So we'll close that out. Now we'll take our memory stick out. We're through with that. And keep that in a safe place. It'd be good to put a lanyard on these and to also maybe put them in a bag with like a little uh, post-it note paper uh, reminding you what version this is, reminding you whether it's been slipstream. For example, I know this is from the Windows Media Creation Tool and this is build 2004. We got a successful install. We didn't have a BSOD. If you're running an older version of the Windows Media Creation Tool and it downloads that ISO, that ISO will not have the drivers for this Wi-Fi card and will cause a BSOD. So, build 2004. Remember that. We'll set that aside. Next, driver CD. Oh, by the way, we don't have a burner. So we got to have to put a burner in here so we can get access to the CD. Otherwise, we have to go online. So, I'm going to shut the machine down. We're going to put a burner in, connect to one of our SATA ports. And we have hot swap hot plug now on the Threadripper 3 that we don't have on the Threadripper 1 and 2. We have the first setting for AHCI, but the second setting for hot swap hot plug is not there on those motherboards with the X399. It is here. Right now we need to get a burner in this machine so we have access to our driver CD. So we'll shut it down. And once that shuts down, I'm going to also turn off the power on the back. Then I will press the button on the front just to make sure there's no power to anything. Okay, power's drained. So, now this particular burner has been sitting on the shelf. This is not an M-Disc burner, but this is good enough to do what we need. We don't use M-Disc, haven't bought these when I got a good deal on them. So we'll use this. This is an LG, but it's a Blu-ray burner. I have cables, which I probably won't use. I have a driver CD, which is actually applications. Uh, because of the date of these applications, I probably won't use this. And that was the reason for buying this drive at the time for this driver disk, which is not really a driver disk. It's a uh, software disk. There is no driver. The operating system loads a driver. That, that's all you need. So we're going to install this. We've got two connections on the back to make. So here's our LG burner. We'll take a look at the manufacturer date. And this shows the model. Manufactured July 2011 ROM version 1.00. And we're going to have two connections in the back. Once we install this, we need to connect data and power. Now, to install this, we will use the cables that came with the drive, which are, when you build, it's good to be organized. So we have our cables, a pair of those, Gigabyte TRX40 designator, the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti video card. Had to get that image in there. I just think that is so cool. Burner, cable. Now, the cables that come with the um, motherboard, there are four, two per package. You'll have one that'll be straight, one that's a 90 degree. Something like a burner, depending on where we put it, we should be able to use a 90 degree cable. I just assume they use all four of them straight, but they don't. Well, these are nicer cables too, higher quality. They're um, a woven braided cable. So we'll get this inside. Now something I like to point out are these two drive bays. We're gonna use the burner in the bottom drive bay. And for this case, when we slide this in, there's a locking mechanism on the side with a Corsair 750D airflow. That'll just slide in, locks, lock it down from this side, right there. 
This one space will give us two drives. We'll have a three and a half inch and a two and a half inch. So we can get a standard three and a half inch drive and the two and a half inch SSD for our media so we can transport back and forth, which will come in handy. Nice. And we have a separate video up about that drive for the three and a half inch and two and a half inch. And then we'll use this top bay for the other device by ACASA that will let us, unless, unless we get the new wiring harness to swap out one of these USB 2 ports, that will give us two more USB 3 ports and USB C port right here. So we have options. Now because we're putting this drive in the bottom drive bay, a 90 degree angled cable will be easier to install than a straight one. Now they also make 90 degree left and 90 degree right. This is just the standard 90 degree cable that comes with the motherboard with the braiding. Nice cables. So let's get that installed. Data, bag of cables from the power supply. And we're gonna need one that's labeled SATA. Clear on this end for the power supply. Two SATA on this end, two SATA on that end. Power. And for any of you that are uh, neat freaks about the power supply, just remember, we're building a machine. This is getting through the smoke test and getting everything up and running. We still have more RAM to add, but we're working with the basics. The reason I say this, we're not wiring all these cables down for the power supply. What if we change power supplies? Then we have to take all those cables out. So when we get to the neatness photo, when we get to the beauty shot, then I'll acknowledge that fact. But this is not the beauty shot. We're still in the build session. We're still getting our foundation done. Now we've used some twist ties. I love the zip ties, but the problem with those, I've cut too many of them where I've put stuff, tied it down, and had to cut every one of them out. So all we've done is use some twist ties. And by reusing the ones that come with the uh, power supply, reusing the ones that come with the motherboard, I've got some stuff tied down where it's a little bit neater, but it's easy to take out in case we take the power supply out and swap it out. Even though we have a nice power supply, a super flower, we might change this out to a C-Sonic later. Depends. We'll just have to wait and see. Who knows? Uh, so far, I'm happy with it, but I like that option. At this point, while we're at it, once we're doing this uh, little bit of configuration extra, uh, and we're going stepping through this, because remember, we're still going through the power on self-test, the smoke test. We're still checking the integration of the system as it operates to uh, make sure we have full functionality. In other words, when you build, keep it simple. Always remember that. Keep it simple. And we're building on that, so if at any point we have an issue, we will know at what point to stop and to solve it. In other words, if you build everything into the computer in the beginning and you have a problem later, then you're left trying to figure out, well, WTF, what happened? So keep it simple, build your foundation, and then build on that. And the reason I mention that, we don't have the PEG connector, the PCI Express graphics connector, which is the extra power tap to the motherboard. We're going to do that right now. Let's take a look at the overhead, so I'll show you where the PEG connector goes. Right there's our PEG connector. So we've got our power tap installed, and I'm coming off the same leads, which is one and two here on top, and this will be number three. So those three are right in line out of that block, and that's going to end up going right there. So I'll route it out, route it back in here. The notch for the lock goes up, so we'll turn this around up. The reason we're plugging in the PEG connector, which is the PCI Express graphics, no, we're not installing a second video card, but we will be installing the NVMe card. That's going to be in a separate video. And then we also have the Thunderbolt card. That too is a separate video. Basics. Basics. Keep it simple. So we have that plugged in. Put everything else back out of the way. Now again, we're not using zip ties. This is for temporary housing. Once we're satisfied with everything, and if we leave the power supply in, then I can replace these twist ties with zip ties. This just makes it easier to work. Another thing I like about this case, there's plenty of attachment points. You know, so many cases don't have the attachment points and you have to use the stick-ons. Well, guess what? Those stick-ons work really good for a while, but if you keep a case for very long and rebuild computers through them, eventually those stick-ons pop loose and then you're like, wow. Uh, but initially, they're, they're, like, uh, they're like they're down with super glue. So I like the metal attachment points a lot faster. It lasts. Okay, we've got our cables fairly well secured using our twist ties. I like to be able to recycle stuff. Don't like to be wasteful, even with cable ties, zip ties. Okay, we got our burner set. Now we need to get back up into Windows. So let's power back up. Turn on the power switch because that's been off. Power on, power on. The burner should automatically be recognized. So as soon as we get that up, back into Windows, we'll take a look, get our driver disk out. And here we come back up into Windows. Now we're back in Windows. Let's just go double check and make sure our burner's there. And it is. Okay. Again, we need to check everything, even all the ports on the back of this board. We need to plug into every port and make sure that every port works. The antennas, we need to plug those antennas in to make sure that works. Whether you use the wireless or not, again, you need to check all that stuff. Leave no stone unturned and take nothing for granted. Driver CD. And of course, if you don't have access to the driver CD, you can download them. 
And yes, I know if you don't want to have a burner internal, you can do one external. I know all about that. But we use DVD Architect. Okay, here we go. Choose what's going to happen to this drive. And I wasn't fast enough. So, Windows Flag E, this PC, and do you want to allow this app to make changes? Yes. Now, what I'll probably do is go into Windows later and uh, turn off that UAC because I find it very annoying. But that's just me. Okay, here we go. Now, we're only going to go for basics. We're only going to go for basics at this point. So what I'm saying is all we want are drivers. There's a whole bunch of garbage in here that you do not want. Keep it basic. Keep it simple. There's, there's things that will cause you grief later. So you need to build on a machine on that foundation then add things slowly. There's a reason to the madness. This is a new platform. We need to get our comfort zone. We need to find out what works. And this is the way you diagnose. Now, if you've built a dozen of these, you can blow through all this stuff. But if this is your first one, you need to go on this foundation and do one step at a time. You'll save yourself a lot of grief if any of you ever had a gotcha or you say, what's going on? And you're freaking out asking somebody, well, how would they know if they don't know what point, what point you started and what point you stopped? And usually when people have a computer problem, they don't think logically. They're not thinking up here. They're thinking here. So if you're thinking emotionally, cool your jets, have a seat. And if you've got any questions or problems, we're here to help. You've always got help. Just remember that. So let's see how far we can get, and I'll show you what we need to install. Remember, it's drivers. Okay, everything is checked by default. We don't want drivers and software, so we'll remove Google Drive, Google Chrome, Toolbar, nothing from Norton, AMD chipset driver, Realtek USB audio driver, Intel network connection software, Intel Wi-Fi driver, that's for the AX200 card. Intel Bluetooth driver, and of course we have Intel Bluetooth 5. And the DTS APO, that's for digital theater sound effect. We'll go ahead and leave that for now. We can always uninstall it if we have to. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six. Those six things we are going to install. Express, we've deselected the other items. And it shows AMD chipset driver installing, which is what we want with the Express. Otherwise, we'd have to step through these one at a time. We don't want to do that. So this is nice. We can select what we want to quick install, but we don't have to quick install everything. Just want the basics. Now, once we get this done, we need to reboot the computer to make sure it comes up and enumerates the devices for the PCI Express bus. If you go look at Device Manager right now, it's a wreck because it doesn't see anything correctly. Video may splash uh, once we get chipset drivers. I know it'll splash and change once we get video drivers. And while you're at it, you may want to go download the Ryzen... Uh, DRAM calculator, we'll save that for another video once we get the RAM in, and then we'll talk about how to set those RAM timings, but not XMP more than likely. We'll see. And Nora says, we recommend that you install the drivers and software listed below. Windows is going to restart, so while Windows is restarting, drivers only. Uh, for those of you that want the lights, good luck with that. I wouldn't do that right now. Again, those are the kind of things that give you grief. It is what it is. We're not building this to look pretty. We're building this to work hard and... Uh, hopefully help us uh, work period. This is supposed to be a workhorse for rendering audio and for doing video. And once we get this built and we run through some of the things like BIOS settings, setting up DRAM, we'll do some tutorials on all those things. Then we'll show you how we use this computer stuff we plug into it. Like for any of you that are into native instruments, I'll just leave it at that. For virtual instruments, any of you that are interested in storyboarding, some of the graphics work that could be done, we'll show you some of the tools we use with this computer. Okay, Windows is booting back up. At this point, we might go to Device Manager and look, but what we're going to have to do is plug in the network. And we, when we do, it's going to be a race against who's going to be first. Once Windows Microsoft takes over the machine, there's nothing we can do but let it do the updates 30 to 45 minutes. When it's finished, then we can finish with our drivers. But while it's installing, we can go ahead and download our drivers at the same time. We just won't be able to install them. I'm just giving you a heads up. Okay, back to Gigabyte Express Install. There's nothing really to see but a blank screen. Okay, here we are. Installing USB. So chipset driver was installed. Realtek USB audio driver. Installing the Intel network connection software. And that may be too something that you might want to go to Intel and download that connection software. If needed, we can do a separate video on that and the reasons for that. But part of the driver package, we'll put it in for now. I'm eager to get to the point where we start talking about Windows 10 on the Threadripper Pro. And this is going to relate to anybody that's using Windows 10 on how Windows is not a real-time operating system, but it freezes very quickly in succession. Uh, we're going to talk about that in a separate video. 
Intel network connection software install has finished, 69%. Now installing the Intel Wi-Fi driver. And even on a Threadripper 3, if you're having trouble with Windows and it looks like Windows is freaking out, could be the Wi-Fi driver. I'm just saying. Intel Wi-Fi driver, 76%. You know, it's curious. Here we have a workstation class processor, but we're not using a workstation class motherboard. It's a gaming motherboard. It is what it is. Now, when it comes to the Threadripper Pro that's going to be coming out later, those will be workstation class motherboards. Lenovo is going to be the first vendor that's going to be doing that. It will be available to the uh, system vendors as an option later. I'm hoping within uh, six months. But even we don't know the chipset. Even looking at Lenovo, you don't get all the information you need. Now we're getting a message, install finished, please reboot your computer. Now we get the message, install finished, please reboot your computer. And when it comes back up, we should be in business. So we're going to say OK. And now we're going to reboot. Start, power, restart. Should have pulled the driver disk out, not going to worry about it. Used to in the old machines, if the driver disk was left in during this operation, the system would sit and hang trying to install the operating system from that. So it's, the install routine has gotten smarter and it doesn't do that anymore. If you're in an old, on an older machine, then uh, it's funny how the little subtle nuances and little tweaks change over time. Now, we've come from an 8350 to a Ryzen second generation to a Threadripper 2, which was a second generation Threadripper, to now a Threadripper 3. So we're going to be doing some activities where you, we show you and compare the differences in how those machines operate. Probably the best way to do would be to run some of the tests. We won't run the tests individually uh, on a video for all of them. What we'll do is we'll run the test and show you the results of the test for the machines individually. From an 8350 to the Ryzen second generation, which I believe is a Ryzen 1800, to a Threadripper 2, a couple of different Threadripper 2s, to this Threadripper 3. Yeah, let me show you what, see it's looking at the disk, let me show you. Now I have not plugged in the network connection yet, but you'll have to remember when we do plug in the network connection, uh, first thing that's going to happen is Windows is going to start getting interrogated by Microsoft servers and it's going to start doing the update. So it'll be kind of a race while we're trying to download the drivers we're after. But what we'll do is we'll go out and do a search. In fact, what we'll probably do before we do the search for those drivers is we'll install Ninite and with Ninite then we can change our browser. There's other things I like besides what Microsoft gives us. Microsoft is the operating system. You know, there was a time we used OS2, but it is what it is. So we need to download and install Ninite, then we can change our browser, then we'll go get our drivers. And that's Ninite.com. I think we've done a separate video of that. If you watch the one about the uh, laptop, it's in the third laptop video on the Asus laptop. Okay, let's plug in the network because we got to go get some stuff. Let's take a look at the device manager right quick and see how we look before we go out. This PC... Network, properties, this PC, properties, same thing. All right, Gil Boyd, certainly don't want to delete him. This PC, right click, properties. This PC, right click, properties, device manager. And other PCI device, so we've got to go out. Let's see, other PCI device. We have uh, rebooted, and at this point, my concern would be that if we had the Thunderbolt card, and that would be what's causing this. This is why we need to step through this one at a time. We've installed the drivers, but we're apparently missing a driver. That could be something with the uh, system management bus, could be something with a timing driver. Uh, but anyway, the way it's identified right now, we need to go out and uh, get the AMD drivers and let Microsoft interrogate the machine. When they go through the process, they may find something. See our Sabrent Rocket 4. That's our four terabyte boot drive. Okay, now we're gonna plug in the network and go out and start uh, doing our thing. So this is gonna be a race against time. Network is plugged in. There we go. Now, at this point, what I want to show you, when this pops up on the right, we're going to answer this and say yes. I'm going to do Windows key print screen and say yes. Let this be discoverable. That means we have a network connection. This just keeps things simple, so once we're on the network and we start doing our shares, it'll be easier to hook up to everything. So the first thing we have to do is call up the browser. I'll catch the one down here on the taskbar. We will go to N-I-N-I-T-E dot com. Ninite. And we are going to download our new browser. We will take Chrome and Firefox. Now, no matter what your preference is for the browser, there's some things we do with Firefox, but yet there's other things we have to do with Chrome. Uh, for example, we have a plugin that only works with Chrome that lets us do some of our SEO. We might get into some of that too later if you guys are interested. 
There's a couple options on that, but I'm just saying we have to have both browsers. So all I'm going to do right now is the two browsers, but I think while I'm at it, I might go ahead and pull down my Foxit reader. That's what I like for PDF. And this creates one install routine, and this is the only place you want to go to to get your shareware or your other applications you use other than from the vendor themselves. This creates one install routine. It installs everything very quickly. Windows just reset the display. Interesting. So Microsoft has already started working on the machine. Okay, so we have now gone to a higher resolution, so it's going to look a little different when you see it on the screen. You can create a separate install routine for each application or pull them all down in one. I'm going to pull what I need that's necessary. Chrome, Firefox, I will pull down the Foxit Reader because those are essential. I've got to have VLC, that's number four. Have to have that. Uh, Audacity I can get later. I will pull Thunderbird, have to have that. So my essential is one, two, three, four programs, five. So my essential is one, two, three, four, five. There are other programs I will come back here and get later, like uh, Malwarebytes and stuff like that, Spybot, Search and Destroy. I'm just going for these uh, essential applications. So we'll scroll down here to the bottom, it says get your Ninite. It will download that, and right here it says we're gonna save it. I'll do a save as. And this also I will rework later. I have a structure I use for saving files, but this will do for now. We need to get up and running. So we're going to run it. And again, UAC is asking, giving permission. We're going to say yes, yes to UAC, and run the install routine. It's just that simple and just that fast. I'm blowing through EULAs and all that kind of stuff because it's already said yes to go ahead and do the whole job. And it's, and it's pulling everything down real quickly. I'm in a race right now because Microsoft is messing with the machine to do the updates. We'll go in and take a look at those updates in a minute. But right now I'm in a race to get this in because I want to go get my drivers from AMD and then I need to get my drivers for the video card from VGA, maybe NVIDIA. We'll see. I got to see how it looks and how it feels. The point of the drivers are to get everything up and functional where they're 100%, but anything extemporaneous, some of the bloatware that comes with the NVIDIA drivers, I don't want that stuff because we're using this not to look pretty. We're using this puppy to work, to be a workhorse. So right now, installing Foxit Reader, finished. That's pretty quick. That was a whole lot faster than I could do it individually all separate. So now that we've gotten that far, we're going to take the next step, which is let's uh, change our browser. We can show the details, but it just says finished, share Ninite. We don't have access to being able to do that. Now that screen just jumped again. It'll happen while we're uh, messing with the video drivers. We'll do a close, zoom out. What I'm going to do now is right click because we're at a 1080 resolution. I'm going to go to display settings. And I'm going to tell this to change and scale this differently. The reason I want to do this is because a lot of times when I'm on a large monitor, even at a 1080 resolution, everything is so tiny and small, i got to bump it up. The problem with doing this is that even though I've done that, some of the applications don't resize accordingly. It depends on how they've written their application. They have everything fixed for a uh, what's raster versus uh, raster based versus vector based. Most applications are written with icons. Uh, at raster based, which means pixelated. Vector based means it rescales and resizes accordingly. That's what we need. Some applications have the ability of that, not all. But anyway, I'm telling you about that ahead of time. I'm going to set this where I can see this stuff and you can see it as well. And this is where we do it. So I'm going to go for 150% and I'll zoom out, close that. Now I can see those a little bit better. If I hold down the control key and I have a mouse that has a scroll button, I can scroll up and down and make those just a little bit bigger. I like that. And if you remember, because I have turned on that other feature, I can also, when I hit the control key, just tap it and it highlights. A lot of these icons I will uh, put on the taskbar. For example, I need Google Chrome on the taskbar. I need Firefox on the taskbar. I'm going to need Thunderbird on the taskbar. And I need those others to go away. So because I have my icons turned on, what I'll do now is create a folder under the user to get rid of my desktop shortcut icons. Uh, if I turn that feature off, I get rid of all. Uh, what would be nice if there was a feature where you could turn off um, applications that have been installed shortcuts and leave just the default. I don't want to install an application that I have to pay extra for. So I do it manually. I create a folder for that. And uh, I'll show you what I do right quick. It's just a little bit of housekeeping. I'll go to the user and I have uh, lots of files and folders. I'm going to right click. I'm going to create a new folder. I press the W key. Default is folder. I press enter and I'm going to say desktop shortcuts and all these extra desktop shortcuts that I get that yes, I could delete. I'm just going to click and drag all those into that folder. 
and uh, missed one. That one too. There will be a few I will leave. There. I just like a clean desktop. That's how I do my housekeeping. I uh, keep a trash can, I guess you could call it, but it's not a trash can. It's where I keep stuff that I don't want to see all the time. For example, every time I install a virtual instrument, they put stuff on the desktop for their licensing and all that stuff. It's in the menu. Some of those things I put um, in the shortcuts, but I don't want it on the desktop where I see it all the time. I want to keep that desktop clean. A lot of times I use the desktop, like when I'm uh, writing scripts, that's where I'll keep those. And then when I'm through with them, then I'll take them, put them in another folder somewhere else. It's just, that's the way I like to work. I like, like a clean desktop. So now that we've got Nineite installed, we can change our browser. We'll go to our other browser and go download our drivers. And we will go to Chrome and we will go to a search for TRX40 chipset drivers. We see AMD, cookies okay, drivers and software, Windows 10 64-bit edition. It sees the system. Now we don't need the RAID installer. We're not gonna be doing that right now, but we could pull them down while we're at it. What we want is the chipset drivers. So we're going to download that. This has a date of 7-21-2020, and today is 9-3-2020. So we'll pull those down. They download to the default location. And I need to just sit on this because while we're downloading this, Windows is also downloading updates, even though we have Windows 10 2004. So I'm, I'm racing against the clock to download these drivers so that when Windows is finished, then we can proceed. So I have the chipset drivers. Now I'm going to go to EVGA and download their drivers, which is EVGA.com slash drivers. So let's do that. Another tab, we'll do EVGA.com slash drivers, enter. See what that gets us. Drivers and BIOS. Choose the family we have. In fact, I'm going to uh, show the bookmarks bar while I'm here because I need to bookmark this stuff so I don't have to look for it later. So up here are the three dots on the far right corner. We'll click on that, bookmarks, and we'll say show bookmarks bar, which is control shift B. Okay, now that I have the bookmarks bar, I'll just click on that lock icon and drag it to the taskbar. Same with it, with the same thing with AMD. Click and drag it to the taskbar. Now this is just quick and dirty. Later for management, I will come back and create folders and subfolders, categorize that stuff and keep it so it's quick access so I don't go search for it again. I'm just showing you how I work. I like to stay organized because the projects we're going to be working on, they get a lot of information going on. So it's a methodology that starts in the beginning down for the hierarchical structure that we create. Okay, EVGA drivers, choose the family. So this will be an RTX 20 series. Okay. EVGA GeForce 20 series for a 2080. Submit. And same driver, 8-17-2020. We're just running through some of the drivers and doing some checking. Okay, now that we've got it, we will download the driver. And those are coming down over here on the bottom left. So we have the AMD chipset driver, and we're downloading the EVGA driver. And that's 452. And while we're at it, we're going to go ahead and download the driver from NVIDIA. So NVIDIA GeForce 200 series, 2080. We'll leave it with Super. Windows 10 64-bit English, show all. And we have the Game Ready Driver, Studio Driver, Studio, Game Ready Driver, Studio Driver. And these are driver versions, 45206. That's the same driver. So we will take the studio driver and that's coming down over here on the bottom left okay we should be able to go and show that in the folder and here's what we have one chipset driver what I wanted to verify was the drivers for what we're getting for the chipset and both drivers are the same whether we downloaded from EVGA or whether we downloaded from NVIDIA NVIDIA calls this the studio driver which is what we want EVGA just says here's the driver that's what I wanted to make sure of I want to compare apples and apples I didn't want apples and orange I didn't want a game driver. This is not a gaming machine. This is a work machine. That's curious. So there's the two drivers. Both drivers have the same file name, 45206. Okay. Now we need to go take a look in uh, Device Manager and see what's going on. Now we need to go take a look at Windows Updates and see what's going on because Windows Updates right now has got a hold of the machine. But I want to double check. I don't think we'd be able to install the uh, any of the drivers, chipset or anything successfully. It would it would blow up on us and we'd have to redo it again. So I'm going to go check Windows updates. And we'll see where we're at with that status. So for Windows it, so for Windows update, we'll do Windows flag I system. Scroll down. So we're going to go to Windows updates. So Windows flag I. Scroll down. Update and security. And it says no updates available. So we're ahead of the game. It hadn't started yet. So we're going to go ahead with our chipset driver and get that installed. And what we're going to gain, I'll go to the control panel and show you. Control panel. And we don't want to set this yet, but I want to show you under power options. Right now we have oh wow okay we have the AMD Ryzen balance plan I didn't expect to see that so apparently the new drivers we have on the disk from Gigabyte are the latest drivers um, that's good to know I wasn't expecting that I want to go back now and check device manager and see what's going on right click properties 
device manager. And since we've rebooted, all drivers are good. Okay, good to know. What's going on in device manager is essential once we start doing Thunderbolt because all these drivers have to be current. The chipset drivers have to be up to date. The video card drivers have to be up to date to make sure everything on the PCI bus enumerates correctly so we don't get any errors. Then we go after Thunderbolt 3. And Thunderbolt 3 will be last in the chain because we'll do the NVMe card probably first. But we're a long way from getting there. But when we do, there'll be a separate video, I assure you. Keep it simple. So let's see how our display adapter is seen. It sees the GeForce RTX 2080 Ti. I'm going to double check the driver and it shows a driver date of 7-24-2019. So we're going to go with the new driver we just downloaded and see what we get. So the new video driver, here we go. The chipset driver we didn't need to install. So we'll unpack all this. Okay, so right now we're keeping things simple. We're getting our drivers installed. What I need to do now after this step is I need to install the secondary spinning drive in the computer, which I don't have, because that's where I like all my downloads to go. Right now, everything that's downloading, installing, and configuring for drivers is going to that NVMe drive. I'm just saying. But to keep it simple, I'm going through the process, so the next thing I'll add will be that drive. Then I'll take all the stuff I've been downloading, put it over on that drive, and keep it. I like to keep the old drivers. It allows me to keep track of the revisions and version numbers as we go through this. Sometimes, because things get weird with either one of the vendors, like Microsoft, they'll mess something up, and a current driver makes things worse. And depending on the application, you may have to back out and go to another driver till everybody's happy. So this way, I keep those. I keep track of them, and I've got it in case I need it. Because when Microsoft updates your operating system without your permission, uh, they'll go after your network. They may go after your display driver, and it just... We like to keep it simple, keep copies of these drivers, so once we have them, they're there, and, and if we don't need them later, then we don't need them. But if we need them, we've got them. Okay, we are going to NVIDIA Graphics Driver and GeForce Experience. Nope. All we want is the driver. Remember, this is a workhorse, so we will accept and continue. I'm going to do a custom install because I want to see what's going on and where. Graphics Driver, HD Audio Driver, and the NVIDIA GeForce Experience we are not installing. PhysX we are installing, and the USB-C. Yeah, I thought that was kind of curious. This video card has a USB-C port on it, um, which I find kind of interesting. For the things that might use the USB-C port as it relates to the video card, um, I doubt we ever use any of those uh, VR goggles or stuff like that, but uh, it's there. We might as well get the driver down for it. And that was probably the PCI bus error we saw a while ago in Device Manager was looking for that particular device, which... Once all the drivers were installed, it corrected it. But I'm saying that's probably where that came from. Curious. We will go next. Clean install. This is a clean install. But we'll go ahead and say clean install. And preparing. Just in case there's anything there that we need to get rid of. Display resizes. It'll probably blink again looking at the display. It's reset us. And we are zoomed in so we can see what's happening. Fans have kicked up into high. That's something else we need to do is we need to get our thermistors plugged into the motherboard so we can start checking heat. One place is on the video card. That's the one I'm most concerned about. Second would be the NVMe card, just to keep an eye on it. And we can always change the location as we need uh, for when we need. So we are installing the drivers. 8K HDR, the new Pinnacle. Wow. To be able to edit 8K video. Well, first of all, we need to get a 4K camera so we can do 4K. Uh, before we can do 8K, we'd have to have an 8K camera. Oh, by the way, Blackmagic has a new 12K camera. So, uh, you know, shadow of things to come. We'll have to wait and see. Okay, display driver's been restored. And... Um, Boy, we're back in business. Let's take a look at that. It's finished. NVIDIA graphics driver. GeForce Experience, not selected. USB-C driver is installed. Graphics driver, 452. Remember that. The HD audio driver. It's important to note a lot of times when your uh, audio or something gets messed up, the actual driver for your HD audio is the uh, like the Realtek driver or the uh, HD audio driver for the video card. And that's where things are getting all squirrely. So you have to keep track of drivers, and that's why they got to be current. And when Microsoft updates, they'll mess up the audio driver. First of all, they'll usually mess up the network driver. Then they mess up the audio driver, then, which is part of the video driver. So the way that integration goes, you have to remember when you're trying to change things. And there's an application I found out about the other day that makes it easier when you're on something like Zoom, when you're trying to change your audio inputs. Uh, we might do a video about that later. You'll have to remind me. Drivers are finished, and we're going to close. Zoom out. Done. Let's go double-check Device Manager. Okay, this PC... Right click, Properties, Device Manager. And everything looks good. Sees our RTX 2080 Ti video card. Of course, it sees our Blu-ray. 
standard AHCI controller, sound and video controllers. We've got the NVIDIA High Definition Audio, the Realtek. Now what I'm curious about, let's take a look at our USB. All right, there's the NVIDIA USB 3.1, which is USB-C, and it shows the AMD 1, 2, 3, 4. Those are all USB-C. And then our USB 3, and then two USB 2. Yes, there's still a need for USB 2, mice and keyboards. But number one, we need a USB 2 port on the inside. That's where we're going to plug in so we get plug and play with the Thunderbolt 3. You have to keep that in mind. So when we do the drive bay on the front of this case, if uh, we don't do the drive bay and we can get a new wiring harness, it's, uh, it's uh, options for resources. Because with the wiring harness, we drop a USB 2 port, put the USB-C up on front. With the drive bay device, we gain USB-C, but we keep two USB 2 ports up here. Um, any way we go with this, the way these things with all these ports work out, we're going to probably end up with a, a single lane I.O. card so we give all of our ports access to the motherboard resources. Uh, I, don't, I don't like stuff on the front of a case that's not plugged in or not functional. That's just, uh, that's annoying to me. So I'm just saying. But I want to go through and check all this because all this matters. Because as we build this foundation, we're going to eventually get to Thunderbolt 3. And I want to make sure when we do, it's a successful install. So at this point, we need to reboot. But instead of rebooting, what I want to do is shut the machine down, get that second hard drive in there so we can start putting our data and stuff over. That's more crucial for me than getting the other RAM in. That's more crucial for me right now than getting in the uh, other I.O. cards because uh, as a download stuff, I don't, want it, I don't want anything on the NVMe drive I don't have to have in there. So I'm going to shut it down and put in that second drive. So we're going to shut the machine down. Once it's off, turn off the power. Hit the power button just to make sure it's drained. And I'm looking at the light on the rear where it says clear CMOS. Press the power button and power's drained out. So now we're going to turn the machine down, get our drive in. And I need to decide which one we're going to put in. Okay, on this machine for the secondary drive, we're going to put in a four terabyte. Uh, on the uh, X399s, we use two terabytes for the secondary drive. And then the third drive, the tertiary drive that we did all the data that was moving in and out for videos, that drive was usually uh, six, six terabytes or up. So uh, this is a big step going to a four terabyte. But... Uh, Natural progression. Now, if somebody says if you're going to buy a spinning drive, what do you buy? Uh, you can look at the Backblaze stats and see which drives are the most uh, formidable, the most successful. Those are probably the HGST drives. I'll just say the HGST drives, to me, run hot. Uh, they're quiet, but they just run hot. And a drive that runs hot concerns me. And, of course, HGST is uh, owned by uh, Western Digital. If I didn't use a Western Digital Black, I would look at one of the Enterprise drives based on the price. Uh, my concern is when you're buying drives, you want to try to buy a retail drive. Now, if you buy from Amazon, you know, better to buy it on Amazon from Amazon than one of the vendors because the concern is always what's the warranty on a spinning drive? Do you get the manufacturer's warranty or do you get the OEM's warranty? And you can go online, interrogate it, check it, and it'll tell you what the warranty is. So I'm just saying, if you buy a retail drive, buy a packaged retail drive. The easiest way to find those is to go to some place like B&H. B&H mostly sells packaged retail drives. Now, when you're dealing with an enterprise drive, those are not retail packaging. Those are like in an OEM package. But again, check with a vendor, make sure what your warranty is. Uh, I got a lot of data on a lot of drives, so I like something with a longer warranty. I don't use any of the NACE drives uh, because the way, I, and I won't get into that, uh, all drives are pretty much the same. It's the way the firmware is set to make them uh, be seen by the operating system. So I like the black drives. I like the uh, enterprise drives, the gold drives. Uh, I've used some of those. This is a Western Digital Black. It's what we've been using. They work. And we haven't had the problems, but we don't use drives like Backblaze does. But if you want the, uh, the skinny on drives, check Backblaze. And yes, this is an OEM drive. And yes, we got it on Amazon. The vendor, I don't remember. I always watch drives to make sure I can find a drive at a good price because uh, sometimes prices fluctuate. Sometimes it's about availability. Now, the nice thing about this video, we're going to apportion this out, separate it, so you don't have to watch the whole thing from front to back like we've done with the past builds. We did some uh, really uh, in-depth, detailed study of this motherboard. So th those of you that want to see that, you can see that part of the video. But those of you that don't want to see this part, you don't have to watch it. Those of you that do, can. Now... This is in any static bag. This is going to be an internal drive. Let's go overhead. We're going to take that top bay, and that's where we're going to put that drive in. And what's interesting about these, these are plastic, but these bow out. And we're going to need to have a power tap and a data cable for that drive. 
And I keep these anti-static bags so that when I pull a drive out of machine, I got some place to protect it with. Now, I could put this drive in so the connections are on the front, but I like to put the connections to the back. Clip on one side, no screws, bow it out, clip on the other side. Now I can put three drives in here. There might be two, but that's it. That's the box of parts. Drives installed. So we're going to turn this up and we need to get a data cable. And this is where we like to use the straight cables for the motherboard. And we will have to have another power supply connector because the one to the top is too far to get to the bottom. Our bag of parts. And that is Molex. That is SATA. So we want to go data. Oh wow, that's got Molex on it too. I need to save those Molex connectors. I may need them on top. So we need straight SATA. That's all Molex. That's all SATA. Okay. Hard to know sometimes about cables, so I have to think about cable management ahead of time. I want to use just the cables for SATA that where I know I need SATA. For example, I know I won't need any Molex connectors in the bottom. I'm not plugging in any of those old style fans. All fans now are either three pin fans that came with the case or four pin fans like we had to install from Noctua so the motherboard can control them so we get maximum air cooling. But I'm just saying, anything that would use Molex now would be a drive bay device. So any Molex cables I plug in, I need to make sure it's up to the top. Anything going to the bottom is going to be strictly SATA. So that's what I'm looking for, a cable that's strictly SATA. So, so we have a SATA cable that needs to go in here for power. And I will unclick those extra drive cables. Nice, but since this is a drive at the top, and this rack on the back that I pulled out, these are for SSDs, which there was a time that would have been really nice. But remember, this case is five years old. What's amazing to me, a five-year-old case is still the preferred case that we're using. But it's bang for the buck, even with the things that I don't like about it. I guess the number one thing is the feet. The rubber feet will pull off. So I've got power cable routed. Now we will do a data cable for the drive. Clipped and routing to... And we used our very last SATA port, which we'll look at in the BIOS later, for the burner. So we'll use our first SATA port for the drive that will be considered the internal primary drive, secondary to the boot drive. And that cable should be able to just lay right down there. And that will help pull those cables in. Now, if I need to pull that drive out because those cables are wadded up like they are, then I've got to thread that through. It would be a whole lot easier if I had the cables on this side, but uh, looking in the case, it makes it look neater if the cables are on this side because you don't see them. And we will pull power through to the next connector. Okay. And while we're at it, just a little bit of housekeeping. And now we have our power cable plugged in. And we still have taps plugging in more devices. So this power supply has got plenty of room for everything. What's interesting to notice when we power this up, this power supply in the dark, those... Uh, emit an LED light that glow a little bit, which is kind of interesting. Okay, data drive is in. Okay, question of the day. Now that we've got a data drive installed, what's the first thing you have to do to that drive to make it usable? Let's take a look. Turn on the power, power up the machine, and as soon as Windows is up, we'll go to that. And we go through this slow boot process, waiting for the post. We heard the beep, and we're coming up. And once we get into Windows, Windows is coming up now. Windows is up. Okay, now that we've booted the computer, we have Windows up and running, so what we need to do is to go into Disk Management. How do we get there? We're going to show you. Control Panel, Administrative Tools, Computer Management. Now, as soon as I click on Computer Management, another dialog box is going to pop up because it's going to automatically see that drive. If we go to Device Manager right now, we wouldn't see that drive because this is a brand new drive out of the box. And I'm showing you this because we see this a lot of times. New users ask, I bought a new drive, I put it in my machine, I can't see it, what's wrong? There's nothing wrong with the computer. It's a user issue. You've got to go through this process. This is just the way it is. It's a brand new drive. You've got to format it according to what you want. Now, we're going to accept the defaults. This is a GPT system. We'll be using GPT, not MBR. I won't get into those details. That's another video. But we're ready now to take that step. Watch this. Okay, we click on Computer Management. And we're going to go to Storage. Right here, Disk Management. We double-click on Disk Management and a dialog box pops up. Initialize the disk. This is something you get to see for the first time one time. Uh, we don't get to duplicate this unless we get on another disk. So from here we're going to initialize the disk. What I'll show you, uh, I'll bring up Explorer right quick and show you that we don't see anything until we do this. Let's take a look. Windows flag E, this PC, and right here. We see the local drive, C drive, and we see the D drive, which is the burner. We don't see a secondary drive. And we won't see that second physical drive until we initialize the disk. So let's do that. So we'll Alt-Tab over. And right here, initialize the disk. Disk 0, GPT. Now note the GPT-style partition is not recognized by all previous versions of Windows. 
well, once you come this far, you're doing Windows 10, there's no going back. Um, it's not like we can go uh, uh, other choices. It's uh, Windows 10 kicking and screaming. So it's where the technology's at. So we're going to leave it GPT. It's best management. To go through the definitions, another video. So GPT will say, okay, disk is initialized. Now that's step one. Step two, we've got to format the drive because we still can't see it. We'll see a drive letter. I'll show you. See, we still don't have a drive. So now let's format that drive. So disk one is the C drive. Disk zero, right click, new simple volume. Another wizard dialog box pops up. Welcome to the new simple wizard volume. This wizard helps you create a simple volume on a disk. A simple volume can only be on a single disk. And that's all we're doing. We're going to click on next. We're going to go with the maximum capacity. We're going to click on next. And it's going to assign the drive letter E. Now we could change the drive letters from here, move stuff around. But I've purposefully done this for a reason. C drive, D drive, which is removable, and then the E drive. And the E drive is going to be this second drive, the second physical drive. A lot of people like to have their physical drives in a row with their burner down the end. Part of the reason I'm doing this is because when we go into the BIOS, which I'll do in a minute, I'll show you. Because this drive is going to be a stationary drive. But when we plug in the other drive bay device to give us an external drive, that port will turn to hot plug, hot swap. But I'm going to show you where the setting would be in the BIOS when we get through with this, what it would look like. I'll do it again when we do the removable drive in another video. So let's go ahead and once we say next, then explore when it's finished will pop up another window. New volume. Now I'm going to put a label on this so I know what this is. This is the internal data drive NTFS. Perform a quick format. Now for those that are asking, shouldn't we be doing a complete format? Absolutely. More power to you. Uh, if you want to sit there all day and uh, wait for that to happen, it's a great idea. Checks all areas of the disk. These are new drives, the big drives. We used to do that. We don't do that with the drives anymore. It's a good idea to do it, but uh, uh, man, that's like, uh, well, I got things to do, places to go, and people to meet. So we're going to do a quick format. I don't need file compression or folder compression, so we're going to click on Next. Now the wizard tells us everything it's going to do, and it says we're good to go. We're going to click on Finish. Once it's finished, then another box pops up showing us that that data drive is ready. And there it is, Internal Data Drive E. So we can close that, close the control panel, and there's the secondary drive, the internal data drive. And from this point, then I will set all downloads to go to that secondary drive, which would be this PC, Internal Data Drive. What I'll do is create a folder for incoming applications, PDF files, and drivers, and backspace. And I will take that incoming folder, right click and drag it under downloads. And there's a folder for it. Downloads, incoming. And if you notice in the path, I have access to that drive now from my shortcuts on the left. Downloads, which is this PC. Incoming, which is on the E drive. So what I'll do is take these applications, right click, cut, incoming, drivers, right click, paste. And those drivers are now no longer on the C drive. I should have done this earlier, but um, I'm doing it now. And I'm going through the process because everything on this process matters. Part of this process as we're doing this is letting the machine run and see how it behaves. Getting this operating system installed is a big deal with no errors. Moving files and copying files without any errors is also a big deal. We're making sure everything works before we start monkeying with it and adding other stuff. Because at some point, if we have an error, it will be easier to diagnose the problem ourselves. We are our own best tech support. But if you guys run into any problems, give us a holler. Like Tony, we helped him build his machine texting at night on a smartphone. That was kind of wicked. But uh, we helped him get up and running. He helped us keep our sanity while mom was in the hospital. And uh, so now this is the first Threadripper 3 that we've actually touched and put our hands on. But it's the second one we built. Tony, you were the first. And I want to thank you for that, Tony. Second drive's installed. So let's take inventory. We've installed the operating system. We've installed the drivers from the driver CD, which means we had to put a burner in. So that was three things we got done. After we got the drivers and the burner in, then we downloaded the drivers from both AMD, which we didn't end up needing, and we downloaded the drivers from both EVGA and NVIDIA. Both are the same version driver. Both are the same WHQL. We ended up using the ones from EVGA, and we chose the driver at NVIDIA that was just the driver. We don't want all that other stuff because we don't want a gaming driver on here. We don't need a lot of bloat. This thing is about processing, about rendering for audio and video. And we're going to be doing a lot of that this, with this machine and comparing. For example, how much processing power does it take to run some of the Adobe software? We've always said Adobe will take all the resources you can throw at it. And the one application that benefited most of all the applications they tested, you'd kind of be surprised. It was an Adobe application. More importantly, you'll be surprised which one. I'll tell you about that in another video. So now that we have uh, this up and running and we're good to go, 
I'd, I'd like to get into some of the other stuff, like uh, I'd like to get the rest of the RAM installed. Uh, this might be a good point to do that. Hope you enjoyed this. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, thumbs up, and if you found this helpful, let us know. If there's something you'd like to see that we didn't cover, also let us know. So we'll look forward to seeing you next video. We are out.